From the vibrant heart of the UAE to every corner of the world, welcome to season two of the International Classroom Podcast. Here, we not only explore education through a global lens, but also celebrate the unique needs, experiences, and perspectives each student brings. In each episode, we bring you insights and discussions from experts and educators around the world. They share their invaluable experiences, the challenges they faced, and the innovative solutions they've championed. So, whether you're an educator, a student, or simply someone with a passion for lifelong learning, we invite you to be part of this journey. Now, before we dive into today's episode, a quick note. Ensure you're following us on your favorite streaming platforms to always stay in the loop. And if you're tuning in via Deep Teaching on YouTube and you haven't clicked that subscribe button yet, do us a huge favor, do it now. We've been privileged to host some truly remarkable guests and your support in sharing and liking these episodes means the world to us. On to the episode. Um, Dan, thank you ever so much for, uh, for joining us today on the International Classroom Podcast. First and foremost, um, how are you finding Dubai? Uh, very hot. So I, uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm wearing a suit jacket today, so I just realised. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I got here a bit early. You guys said get here 10 past two. I was like, I oh, got here half one. Noticed a Starbucks on the way in. So I said the the kind woman who was driving me here, I said, oh, just drop me off at the Starbucks. I'll walk over. And she was like, are you sure? And I looked out the car. You could literally see this place from, from the Starbucks. I was like, it's literally just there. She was like, She's like, oh, you might want to get a taxi. I was like, a taxi from there to there. I was like, are you joking? I was like, I'll be fine. Yeah, but now I know exactly what you meant. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah, it's good though. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing place. First time here. Uh, I've only been here about a day working with um, the Dubai International Academy this morning with their leadership team. Amazing group. Very hospitable, very welcoming. Um, so looking forward to the next week ahead, really. So I've got... Got a full week of working with with amazing teachers and leadership teams and exploring what what I love artificial intelligence and that's the thing we're here to talk about today. So for the potential listeners out there, people watching who may have no idea who you are, what's been your journey to date with AI? Uh, good question. I imagine most people probably don't know who I am. So uh, I I was a teacher. So I in the northeast of England. Uh, so I was I was a high school teacher and. Kind of every every school I, I worked in over, over those few years, um, I always tried to move over to to Google for Education. I was a big lover of Google for Education, mainly because it was it was the first kind of online platform, ed tech platform I, I really came across when I was training to be a teacher, um, and just saw the potential in it and and how how it could transform the classroom and just ed tech in general. So I always tried to move schools over to to educational technology. Um, so really got into it, and when I became um, uh, a S- member of the SLT in the, in the school I was at, it was mainly because of my efforts of, of moving the school over digitally. And when I got into SLT, I was I kind of got there, and and it, and it came with all of the the trimmings of doing observations and all <laughs> of that. And I was like, I don't think this is for me. This side of it, like I prefer being as someone who was very much at the grassroots kind of banging on the the SLT door going, right, we need to make changes, come on, let's do stuff. Um, then to suddenly be in there and um, have all the the extra responsibilities alongside it, that, I, that didn't really attract me. Like I remember, because I hadn't been qualified long, I think I'd been a teacher two years, something like that, two or three years, and and I remember going in to do observations and, and noticing like a teacher who'd been teaching for 40 years, like start to get nervous. And just being a quite quite a new teacher myself having known that feeling and seeing the look on their face and thinking I don't want to do that to her. I just want it to be natural I don't want him to be natural and and teach the kids as best they can so I just kind of thought I don't want to it's not exactly what I want to do so I decided I wanted to move into uh, to digital education more so a job came up locally for a group of colleges uh, in the northeast of England uh, for the director of digital strategy moved into that role uh, big role, so it was, it was a huge organisation, so th- over a thousand staff, uh, about fifteen thousand students, uh, and for the first time, I was kind of line managing a large team. So I had about thirty members of my team, uh, and the job was to upskill the teachers, the students, digitally, but also kind of local industries as well, because within further education, you you work a lot with industries, and I had a budget as well to start looking at kind of uh, innovative technology. 
uh, and kind of learn from industry where where technology was going. And we we started to invest a lot of money in virtual reality, augmented reality. We had seven campuses, so we we started um, buying immersive rooms, so a bit like so a whole class could experience like a virtual reality room without having a headset on. And 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 we went down that route, and then. All, and I started hearing lots of stuff about AI. AI is going to be big in the next few years. I mean, people, people have been saying that for decades, haven't they? Like, AI is going to be huge when we have robots. But there seemed to be something in this, actually, the, the, the power it has to kind of analyse text and data. And then, so we started to look at that and think, um, how do we start preparing ourselves for this and start maybe using some of the rudimentary tools that were starting to be developed little did we know i mean i'm talking about last year so this is like early last year little did we know that by november of last year chat gpt would be released and all of a sudden yeah all those tools that we'd only imagined of and we thought these could be amazing in the classroom if only we had them i uh, were suddenly available and i noticed that on social media so i was a big twitter user i noticed that kind of early december time last year there was, there was nobody really talking about it from an educational point of view. And then I noticed somebody, somebody on Twitter mentioned it in a negative way about how it could actually um, be a negative force in education. I thought, that's not what I know of this technology. So I just started putting little um, screenshots of, of me kind of creating a lesson plan with it, you know, like... The stuff back by now, anyone who's touching with is like, yeah, yeah, we know we can do that. But in December, <laughs> like six months ago, everyone was like, whoa, what? Um, so started just putting little screenshots out, and, and I was just kind of learning it myself, really going, oh, look what I've learned, look what I've learned, look, do this, do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's how I really got into it, and kind of decided I'd wanted to start my own business for a while, um, and just decided, you know what, there's people want to know about this. Um, I want to. I want to start a business as well. So maybe I should start actually showing people how to use it, try and make make a living out of it, and and kind of kill two birds with one stone. Really help help educators get to grips with it, and then um, be able to do it as a full full time passion, which which I which I have is great. And, and since then, I've uh, released a book um, and and get to travel the world doing this, which is. I'm in a real privileged position, so it's, it's amazing. I get to be in here in Dubai with you guys as well. Yeah, I mean, being in Alex's presence is a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say the same for you, Dan. It's uh, Yeah, I remember seeing some of those things when they first came out on Twitter and going through it, and I would thought I was quite an early adopter of it. I'd seen something about it. It's like, this is amazing, but it's like, you've got to remember now, what are we still in only August? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in that time, it seems like months, it's not even a year, is it? Like you said, you managed to write this book, mm. um, AI Classroom. We were talking about it this morning, weren't we? Because you we were like, were. Yeah, Drew said he was going to get a copy. He hasn't got a copy you yet. Haven't got a, well, I haven't what? got a copy yet because I am very late to the AI game. Right. Everything I know about AI in education, everything I know about AI either comes from the film, Artificial Intelligence with Will Smith, fantastic film, or from Alex. <laughs> so I, you know, this is, this is pretty much everything I know. Um, and I was, I think one of the things I would have asked, which you kind of already answer or already answering would be, you know, you said about the, the 40 year teaching, mm. these people are going to be quite skeptical, aren't they? I was quite skeptical at the beginning thinking, well, I've got all my lessons already. How is it going to speed up stuff that I've already done? I'm making new stuff. Okay. I might tweak things. How is it going to make my life any easier in the beginning? Now I've, you know, adopted more. Uh, how do you say it? More like I'm, I'm, I'm more of an open mind, and I've investigated it myself and spoken to Alex more and done my own little bits of research. I'm kind of like, oh, actually, this is you know really good. But I imagine eight months ago, nine months ago, that was really difficult to get people to try and switch their ways. Is 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 that is that the case? Uh, I guess yeah. I suppose it's one of those things. Isn't it? I think at the minute the if it's going to help you, it's going to help you. If it's not going to help you, I, I would say you don't have to be using it at the minute. And and I think and what, what I do when I talk to teachers is I say, you, there's using it as in just jumping on ChatGPT. A lot of people have tried ChatGPT. They go on, they go, right, uh, write me some questions for my class. I'm doing a, I've got a biology class on plant cells. Write me some questions. And very soon they realise, actually, the response I'm getting here isn't amazing, um, especially if you just write 
write me some questions on <laughs> plant cells. It's going to come up with, usually, because I, I do this quite a bit in workshops, usually it comes up with about 20 questions and they're not relevant to what you've taught. And, yeah. and of course, and, and one of the things I say to teachers as well, as, as I say, there's if you look at society um, and the the skills and the, the jobs that are in society, the, there actually should be no better profession out there to use these tools because asking questions as a teacher is bread and butter. It's like, it's, mm. it's, it's the core of what we do. We ask questions in a specific way to get specific answers so we can measure students' progress. And that's exactly what we're doing with AI. We've got techniques for it. Um, techniques like I do, we, we do, you do, modeling techniques. Mm -hmm. we, we've created pedagogical practice to really uphold good questioning um, and, and elicit certain responses from students. And that's exactly the skills that they're, they're completely transferable to tools like ChatGPT, Google Bard, because, I mean, to, to distill it down into, into a single common sense statement, I guess, it, it can't read our minds. So we have to, we have to really show it what we want. Mm. Like ChatGPT 3.5, which is the free version, if you go on, create an account, it's trained on over 300 billion words worth of information. It's a lot of information. Um, if you read, if you re read in a book, you read about 100 words every 30 seconds it would take you about 2,800 years to read all the information nonstop um, that ChatGPT 3's got access to. ChatGPT 4, which is if you pay $20 a month or using Bing, you can access ChatGPT 4. It'd probably take you about 7,000 years to read all the information if you were just reading nonstop <laughs> that it's got access to. So it's got so much data at, it, at its fingertips that you need to be really specific with what you need out of it. So I, I, I show teachers, I've got a method, which is in the book called the PREP method, where it's it's an acronym for prompt, rule, explicit instructions and parameters. So where it's, and it's just a way to structure your question really. Um, and, we, and we use, teachers use similar kind of models mm. for when asking questions, you know, I don't know if when I was teaching. Paragraphing. Yeah. Like, Peace paragraphs or peel paragraphs or yeah yeah we used to peel yeah the... we used to have like stickers you put in the book so that they could follow yeah, the structure yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's essentially that it's a sticker for, for for teachers to use ChatGPT where they can go right I'm prompting I'm um, giving it a role and all of that is just designed and that just came from me going right I'll ask it a question mm, it's not great I'll ask it another question mm, it's not and just thinking actually I need to keep delving deeper here because if it's got access to so much information you need to narrow its How focus do you a bit. That, yeah. yeah and so things so it's prompt tell it what you're going to do or give it a role so if you wanted to ask uh, write some questions on plant cells for a biology class tell it to be a biology teacher who specializes in plant cells who can take uh, complex information distill it down into simple easy to understand terms that a seven-year-old would be to understand like giving it that specific focus uh, a explicit instructions just means literally detail or everything you want um the chat really doesn't know what your students have learned tell it what they've learned tell it what kind of questions tell it the and then parameters is Things like the format. So, if you want it in a table, do you want it? Uh, in, do you want titles in there? Do you want it to be so many words? The reading age. If you're going to give it directly to students, so it's just a way to get teachers to use it really. And I think to go back to your original question, I think some teachers that do start off by going, "Well, how is this relevant to me? I've kind of got my things. I've got my workflow. I know how to work. I know how to do what I'm what I'm doing. I've been doing this for years, but." Once I kind of show them actually, well, if you do this, look at the difference in the results you're going to get. And yeah. one thing I always say is the quality of the input dictates the quality of the output. So getting good at, at the input, the question and the prompting is going to give you uh, amazing results if you if you, if you you practice and get it right. And once you show teachers that, because it's amazing at the start of a session, I, I, always say it, I always say, put your hand up if you use ChatGPT. Normally about like 60, 70% <laughs> yeah. are like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I was in Wales recently and there wasn't that many put their hand up, but uh, <laughs> I think things arrive slowly in Wales. But uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I, I got a friend who does the fibre optic for the whole of Wales. The, the broadband, <laughs> he's going to be fuming about that. <laughs> it's a, normally I use that joke on, on, my, on Newcastle. Um, I suppose it's different when you take the mick out yourself. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so you, but then I say, how many people are using it every day? 
hands go down and there's always always just a few hands left up. And I'm like, right. So obviously you've tried it and it hasn't compelled you to keep using it. Why? And I think it normally comes down to what I'm saying, that yeah. they're not asking it the right questions. Yeah, we spoke with, I think we got a mutual friend in Peter from Real Fast Reports. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, yeah. just saw the interview did with them. And when we spoke with him, he's got that phrase of garbage in, garbage out. Right, right. And it kind of, that just reiterates me what you're saying about the prompts. It is that where so many teachers just struggle with quality prompts. And if you just change it a little bit here and give it something different, the output you get is, ma is massively different. Like we were talking about jobs of the future. I don't know education wise, you always do about that, don't they? Mm. They talked about prompt engineers yeah. like, and how much money prompt engineers are making at the moment from just being able to write and sell quality prompts. $300,000 a year. Some jobs are going for in America. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I'm in the wrong business, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I, re I really like that like structure. And I, I imagine in the book, there's way more tips and tricks, oh, yes, which is yeah, why, yeah. to go back to what Alex originally said, I was uh, I was having a little peruse through Amazon today and uh, sent a link over to my head and said, you know, what, what do we think about having a look at this? And we're, we're still quite a new school. We've got a very experienced team, but we're a very, very new school. And we're looking for things that are going to streamline what we do. So, um, and anything, one of the, one of the best things that I thought was really helpful was as, as you were talking then, what, what do you want the format to be that it comes out and do you want it as a table? When I realized that you could get rubrics or tables come out mm. at the, as an end result for like a market grading rubric or something like that. And it does all the little lines as it's building it. I was, my mind was blown. So anything that like helps me understand because i i don't know what i'm asking it i would need that's what I, i'd say i'd be that guy who goes um give me a hundred words that explains how an oxbow lake is for a reading age of five yeah. for the well, maybe not five maybe yeah. ten or year five and then it would come out and i'm kind of like okay well what can i then do with that and then something alex was talking to me about was like you know taking that and building it as a gap filler. Now that would take me 15 minutes to go through, delete the words, write the words at the bottom. We mm -hmm. just say, turn this into a gap filler, only take out words that are over six, like, six characters. And mm -hmm. building that kind of bank of knowledge has really helped me save so much time over this summer building my resources for next year because we're growing year on year. So we have year 11 this year. This is the first time we're gonna have year 11. Those resources aren't built because I'm not as up to date with my current affairs on case studies that are more relevant from now. So I would want to put and take an article, put that article in and say, can you summarize this? There we go. That's summarized. That's easier for the kids to read. That saves us time, like easier than me reading through it and summarizing it. So these little things that we've been practicing are saving time, especially when you've got so much to do in the year. And I think if I had more help, with knowing other ways of using it, that's exactly what I, I would be looking I for. Think so. you, I think you've hit the nail on the head there when you said that I wouldn't know what to ask. And I think that's probably the biggest barrier to to some of these tools is that the I suppose you're limited by your own imagination. Mm. Not that you've got a limited imagination. But uh, the... Well, look, look how colourful he is. He's, he's <laughs> no, imagination it. there. None of it's my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the thing of you don't know what you don't know, do you? So I see a, a large part of what I do is I'm not doing something that the teachers can't do. Otherwise, there'd be no point getting me in to, to deliver some training to your school because I'd walk out the door and the teachers wouldn't be able to do any of it. It's... It's going, look Look how easy it is, and here's some examples. So I was really adamant, even though it, it was the bane of my life, to put, uh, there's a chapter in the book called uh, 40 Prompts for Teachers, I think it's, I think it's called. Uh, <laughs> was, it's been a few months. That would be the but, first uh, one I would flick to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it, and it's all, so the chapter before that, he introduced the prep method, yeah. and then all the 40 are kind of based on prep, so, and, and it's like, it's a template for each one, so it's like everything from design a lesson plan to a, a risk assessment for a school trip and kind of everything in between. And I kind of see the purpose of that, of not going, oh, look, um, I'll show you the, the technical way to do this. I'll show you the skill. It's not entire, It's not all that, you don't need that much skill to do it. It's just more going, look at what you can do to try and spark some ideas. You can nick this idea, but you could also, also inspire to go, actually, I could do, could do something else with this. I could, and I think, to be honest, I think there are still, I mean, sometimes I think, because when I, when I formulated that and I go out and, and I go to schools, I think it's been a few months since I came up with those prompts. And I'm always thinking kind of, how could, how could I make it more dynamic? How could I 
how can I actually take it to the next level? Um, which, and I think it's coming from, I mean, I know so far we've talked about kind of text to text AI models, um, but, but there's so much more out there in terms of text to, to image, text to video, mm. text to audio, uh, that when, uh, there's, there's a term if, if you're in the ed tech world called app smashing where people go right let's let's take some apps make them work together see what we can get and when you do some app smashing with with ai tools the the, the results can be phenomenal especially if you've got chat gpt giving you like the let's say the dialogue for a character you've got a tool like mid journey an ai mm. uh, image tool creating the image the image for the character you've got um, an AI voice generator, you've got an AI animator and bringing all that together. Literally, I, I, I show teachers, I uh, was doing this this morning, literally how to create their own video using four different websites in 10 minutes, that's all it takes. So they, wow. the the possibilities out there, um, something I, I, I put in the book is that in the AI era, which I think we're now in, um, will be to create new worlds simply using words. And, and, and I said that because I think creativity now is, is, is accessible for, for people where it wasn't in the past. And what I mean by that is like the, the floor has been, has been lifted. So someone like myself who doesn't have any artistic skills really, um, I can now use a tool like Midjourney, an, an image generator, and using specific prompts, which is essentially, if we boil it down, literacy skills. Yeah. So using literacy, I can now create art. Using literacy, I can now create a bit of a bit of video. So it's, and I and I really think it's interesting because back in back in January time, I remember you know some of those negative comments I was talking about on on social media. A, a lot of them were around. Well, this is going to destroy literacy. Because if you think about it, um, students are going to be able to go, right, oh, I need to answer that question. I'll put it in ChatGPT, get the answer. There we go. They're not going to learn how to write. And I actually think it's a red heron. I think it, and I think it's a false dichotomy. I think actually AI is going to, or maybe the other way around, we're going to need improved literacy to use AI. Because anyone who's ever tried to get that, that good quality out of AI knows that you've got to really be specific what you're saying you need to be able to communicate what's in your head in natural language because these are natural language processes um, in order to describe and explain what you need so i think it'll, it'll hopefully i mean i'm i'm very optimistic when i in, in my view here but hopefully it'll help drive literacy and we're not doing very well at that i was at two years ago in the uk a third of all uh, GCSE students failed their their English GCSEs a third, wow. um, and we and we we it's... kind of pride ourselves on that kind of maths English element in the in UK edu- in British education, almost to the detriment of other subjects sometimes. But actually, when you boil it down and have a look at it, we're not doing too well at them neither. So we really need to, um, yeah, yeah, we need to do something about that. I like the fact with it as well for us here internationally. I mean, we've got over forty nationalities in my school. You've brought, I think, a few more in yours, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Tom, you've got quite a few in Kent, haven't you? 92. Um, and the languages ChatGPT can recognise that you can then just put in and just go, can you convert this to this, this, this? Or can you make these questions for it? Like, yeah. I've got an example. I've got a student in my class, uh, Ukrainian. I was I was thinking exactly the same. The, the... And in terms of he sits there on his laptop and he's got a mm. Google Translate, whatever it may be. It's like, nope, don't need that. Um, can just do this, do this, blah, 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 and then give him this. And he's like, so this is amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's so helpful. To, and it just builds confidence. And then you start to ideate. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. And, and this is just my experience with teachers. We seem to forget then we've got pedagogical skills because we go, well, pedagogy is what I do. And I don't seem to bring it together with technology. And actually, if you went on to, to chat GPT and said, ah, you know what? Give me some visible thinking routines that I can use to do this, this, and this. I'll now put it into Arabic or Russian or Ukrainian or Japanese. And then you could bring in that side of it and go, right, actually, you can now communicate across multiple levels. And if you want to challenge the kids, you can try and teach them some words in other languages because mm-hmm. we're all about so you trans, you know, transdisciplinary bringing things together. And it's a multiple way of doing it. And I would never, a year ago, would never have approached my teaching as a scientist, would never have done that. Um, but I'm really interested, you brought Midjourney, and obviously you've just released something because it came through to my email the other week as well, so I know obviously you've got that pack out there for Midjourney. I was really reluctant to get onto that to start with because in my mind I was like, how am I going to use this in teaching? And for me as a biologist, um, how am I going to use that? 
Um, and I'm really interested in your take on it in terms of from different subjects, how you can see sort of that, that imagery part really captivating students' learning. Yeah, it's a good question because I think one of the reasons why I took so long to, to release something on Midjourney was because I think I was thinking the same thing. So I started using Midjourney, about the time, same time I started using ChatGPT, um, and always thought, because I would always mention it in presentations and always show it as an example and always had in the back of my mind, I need to do a tutorial on this. Because it's quite complex to get set up. You need to have be on Discord, you need to then register for Midjourney, you need to then put them together. Um, but I just kind of thought, I need to sit down and really think about what are the, what's the impact because I'm a big believer that uh, tech should support learning. It shouldn't just be tech for tech's sake. And, and I think sometimes with these, especially if you go and just look at this shiny new toy, come and have a play with it, you're just going to put a lot of teachers off because um, teachers have a... I normally say I have a good BS sensor. Can I say that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, okay. So uh, you can use the full word. If you <laughs> <know>. <laughs> so teachers, I think teachers have really got a, a a really good like BS sensor when it comes to anything new because I mean you know teachers are, are time poor. They've got so much to do. Um, I remember I remember back. I mean it feels like a lifetime ago now, but I remember kind of working on a Sunday, working on it on weekdays. Um, it's it's an intense tense job and i'm sure teachers watching this don't need me to tell them that um so actually anything new comes along if it's not going to show immediate impact it's like i'm just going to leave it there i might come back to it and have a look later chances are it's not going to happen so you need to show immediate impact and i think mid journey was one of those ones where i think is where's the immediate impact because there's there's lots of indirect impacts like what could you use this for in terms of resources well normally i go to google images um Maybe I shouldn't because of copyright reasons, but normally I'll just go to Google Images, find an image of Pixabay or, or, or one of the, the copyright free sites. Um, so why do I need to create a new unique image from scratch uh, and, and pay for the pleasure of it as well? Um, I think in that, in that video that I released, um, I, th I think it has to go hand in hand with saving some time. So if, if someone's new to AI, um, and wants to start making a direct impact, just leave Mid Journey for now. I think just if you if you're interested in it and it's just something you want to play around with because it look because it's really cool and can create amazing photorealistic images of pretty much anything you want. Uh, have a play around with it because it is amazing. Um, but I think if you see yourself as a teacher, and I know not all teachers see themselves as this, but as, as as like content creator, as somebody who creates materials. Um, and, and wants to make them as engaging as possible, then if you're saving some time with something like ChatGPT, um, I, I did this experiment actually where I, 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 would, I would normally spend at least three hours on a Sunday preparing for the coming week when I was a teacher. And I, and I did the tasks that I would normally do using ChatGPT and I think it took me about 20 minutes. So I, I'm, when I say it saves time, I, I, I speak to teachers all over the world on a weekly basis where it's, it's saving them so much time. If you're going to save some of that time and you want to be more creative, you want to create more engaging resources for your students, I think um, going on there and being able to create unique images can be really impactful. So for, even for things like, um, I don't know, let's say you're teaching Romeo and Juliet and you want to get some some good photos of the different scenes um, and there's no photos out there, you can go off there and just well, literally within a few seconds have photorealistic images of the scenes. What I really like... Um, is the f it's it's the app smashing again? So it's the ability to create a resource that goes beyond just a two D image, but where you have to start with a two D image. So, like the example I give before, that's actually a real example of. I worked with a history teacher back in January, and we created Henry the Eighth just by simply getting Mid Journey to create a picture of Henry the Eighth. We used ChatGPT. We told ChatGPT to be Henry the Eighth. Um, talk like Henry VIII and limit its knowledge to what Henry VIII's knowledge might have been. Not an exact science, but uh, we asked it and the answers it was giving us back when we were talking to ChatGPT, Henry VIII, were, were, were accurate and historical. So we took some of that dialogue, we put it into an AI uh, voice generator, player.ht. Um, so where you can just put it in, you download the audio file, and we had the mid-journey file. Then there's a tool out there called DID, D-ID, where you can upload the audio file, upload the image, and it'll turn it into a, to a, a realistic animation of, of, of that figure who you've chosen, in this, in this case, Henry VIII, talking. Um, 
and that technology is progressing so much. And now, and now DID has got the, the ability to have a real life conversation with the avatar. So you're not just telling it what to say, but it takes on almost the brain of chat GPT and you can talk to it in real time and it answers you back. So I think to use kind of a, an image generation platform, you don't have to use Midjourney. I mean, if you've got Canva for education, a lot of teachers use Canva. There's an image to text tool in there. There's Dolly, which is uh, created by the same people who made uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI. There's, that's free to a certain extent, I think. So you can go and create it. You can upload it to these tools. You can create, um, and just to give you one example to take it a bit further, that we I then worked with an English teacher where, there's a, there's a great tool out there called Blockade Labs. Works a bit like um, an image generator where you type in what you want. You don't even have to log in for this. You just type in what you want. Instead of creating a 2D image, it creates a 360 degree immersive image, which you can then put a, a VR headset on and actually be within that image that you've just created. So we we created the the Finch household from To Kill a Mockingbird. And then we, we then created videos of Scout, um, very similar to how we did Henry VIII of Scouts, Atticus and Tom Robinson and, and embedded them within this virtual environment. So now she has a, a bespoke, immersive virtual reality environment that her students can either put a headset on and enter or just watch it on a screen and drag it around um, where the, her students can now get to know the characters by listening to the listening to the characters and hearing from the characters and um, so I think the that was thirty minutes by the way so from start to finish that was created in thirty minutes when I was working in VR my old job um, that kind of piece I, I was commissioning um, to get created by companies and we were spending about fifteen thousand pounds on on something similar and now a teacher with no skills can create. <laughs> Uh, worlds like that. So before when I said in the AI era we'll create new worlds simply using words, uh, no exaggeration, we cre create virtual reality worlds within less than half an hour. It's got my, my brain's whirling. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've got so many ideas of how you could do this, you know, like yeah. I'm thinking from a, from a geography point of view, the image generation is brilliant because as you say, I'll look on Google images and it's never the right kind of picture or especially if you're trying to create new exam questions so the first, my mind instantly goes to when you see a um, wave cut platform and if you type into google wave cut platform it's the same four images come up every right. single time now exam boards will have a picture of a wave cut platform but to identify a wave cut platform is quite difficult for students to do when you see it you're kind of like is it a beach is it a cliff is it what, what are they asking for here but to generate those images, you know, you can have thousands of different versions of a wave cut platform. And so this is this is how it could look. You're giving bespoke images to students, you know, some a little more tricky than others to be able to challenge them in all different ways, exactly that way. But then as you were saying about this, um, creating a world, you could get the students to create their worlds using the key terms that you've given them. So you could say, okay, I want you to create a coastal landscape now, or I want you to create a drainage basin or a river valley. I want you to create that and then show us mm. and demonstrate, okay, so has it got meanders? Has it got oxbow lakes? Has it got, what? How, how have you created this bespoke river for you? What inputs have you given? And you can dissect that as a class. You could like- That's where I want dissections. Yeah. Like VR headset dissections. Like, because here, especially in this international, there's things we can't get. There's things we can't get in classrooms yeah. sometimes. And for me, it's like, okay, well, if I can't get eyeballs, you could do that. You could, and give it the information of what it needs, and you could do a virtual one. You could do the heart, we get heart dissections, lungs, um, all sorts. You want to do bacteria labs. You want to see what's going to happen, what these things look like on a microscopic level. We can't do it. Oh, well, we could run it in this. You could then, literally like magic school bus the students, couldn't you? Shrink everyone down, down yeah. and go inside the human <laughs> body and be uh -uh. like on the journey of oxygen through a vein. Yeah. Uh, does oxygen go through a vein? No? It can do. Artery? Yeah. Yeah, In a small. red blood cell. Yeah. Yeah. So, small apparently. Yeah. There you go. You, you'll know more. Yeah, yeah. This is, I'm looking at it like, uh, <laughs> well, I was looking at you when you were talking about whatever it was geography wise. I was like, I'm going to smile. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to smile and nod because I don't know what you're talking Very, about. I got excited. But, can you tell? It's amazing. But that brings us, it kind of, for all those possibilities and amazing parts, if we take a step back to the skeptic of us, it's like, do you think this is going to create a divide in education? Because not to bring up the fact you mentioned Wales and its terrible internet connection. That was Dan, by the way. It wasn't me or Drew. <laughs> <laughs> like Dan. Um, yeah, to um, all our listeners in Wales, we love you and we stand <laughs> with you. But 
there are people out there that are worried about the divide, the educational divide for those who have and those who haven't yeah. and what that could potentially create. Do you, do you think the accessibility, do you think we're going to have mm. those gaps forming in the next few years? Yeah, I've got two takes on this. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, by all means. So I think the first one is the obvious one. Uh, schools that, that use AI compared to schools that don't use AI. Uh, COVID uh, really shone a light on the those who had students who had the skills and the hardware to be mm -hmm. able to to access online learning versus the students who didn't have skills and didn't have the hardware. Like, and I was at that time I was working in a high school. Um, in a in an area, an old mining village in County Durham in the UK, um, which isn't the most privileged area in the world, and and those that that kind of gulf really shone through. Uh, so we had students who were literally because they had the skills, because they had the hardware, were learning more at home than they than they would have if they'd been in school. And then the opposite end, we had some students who just didn't learn anything for two years. Um, so we already had a gulf. We already had a massive gulf. Now, with if some schools are going to start using AI, or even some students going to start, with, which they are, yeah, and in spite of their, or despite their their school telling them to use it or not, and then some students not using it, the that is that's going to be a hundred times. It's not just going to be double. It's going to be a hundred times because the ability and the the kind of the the doors that AI opens to, to different skills and to different capabilities, like I said before, it raises the floor. Um, so it raises the floor on creativity, on on our ability to do certain things. So absolutely, yes. The the other take I've got um, is 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 this. I think, uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to get into this, but I think one of the indirect consequences of AI that not many people in education are think about at the moment is non-traditional competition. So most schools, uh, public schools, state schools, don't have to worry about competition, never had to worry about mm. competition. Um, I grew up on a council estate in northeast of England. We went to the local school uh, and then the local secondary school, and that was that was it. That's what you did. Uh, that school didn't have to compete with any other school. It's just it's just really... just in the football. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now I get that's different for further education. Tends to have to colleges have to compete with local colleges, uh, independent schools sometimes have to compete with other other schools in the in the area. However, the actual the core of what they deliver doesn't really change. It's not like. Netflix versus Disney, where they've got completely different packages available. It's pretty much the same. Now, we can talk about school culture, we can talk about skills of specific teachers and leadership teams and all of that. But actually, at the heart of it, it's pretty much the same. Now, and what might make the decision for some parents is the prestige of a school, might, whatever it is. But I think, I mean, that's traditional competition. I think we're, we're just about to enter an era of competition the likes that education never had to deal with before, ever had to deal with. And we're walking blindly into this. I mean, not many people actually are, are, are keeping an eye out on what's coming over the horizon. And what it is, is privately owned educational providers who are building online schools right now. And it's happening all over the world. So one that I'd like to give an example of is Synthesis out of California. So Synthesis, uh, I know Josh Darn, he's, he's been on my podcast a few times, uh, great guy. Essentially, he was teaching at a school in California. Elon Musk's kids went to that school. And Elon Musk said to his kids, he said, look, tell me which of your teachers is, is inspiring, who really inspires you. And they, they said, oh, Mr. Darn, Josh Darn. And he said, why? He says, well, because he, he gives us like real world problems to solve in the, les in the lesson and, and gets us to problem solve. Elon Musk got his secretary to ring Josh down and said, uh, Elon wants a meeting with you at SpaceX next week. Josh Don goes over to this meeting. Like I've spoke to Josh a few times about this. He was like literally shaking in the car on the way there, being like, what's, what's going on? Uh, so Elon Musk sits down with him. He says, look, you're my kid's favorite teacher. Uh, they love what you do. And I like the sound of how you apply the learning. Um, can I, I'll give you some money. Can you set a school up here at SpaceX? We'll give you one of the conference rooms, just like I say, a school with like a few kids. So, so my my, I think he had, I think he's got triplet boys. So he's like my my three boys and the the boys of, and girls of some of the other 
uh, rocket scientists. They'll join you in the conference room each day. Just want you to make the learning fun, problem solving, collaboration, all that type of thing. You know, the, the kind of the, the skills that Elon Musk kind of prides himself on. And if we're being honest, the World Economic Forum is is said are, are vital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you read anything the World Economic Forum has put out on, on on skills and what's needed from education over the last few years, it's all these skills. So uh, essentially, uh, Josh, uh, you, be, Elon Musk being Elon Musk, his kids were ready to leave the school, <laughs> so he just wasn't bothered about it anymore. So uh, he said to Josh, I'll give you some money. I want you to go set up your own school. Josh set up Synthesis, which is an online school where they develop problem-solving activities, games. They, they design their own software where students essentially get on a video call with students from all over the world. They work collaboratively with, with each other to solve them. They've just released their first ever AI tutor, chatbot tutor, in collaboration with a, an organization called DARPA in America. And they... Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah. And and uh, in math, they're just doing maths at the moment, but it's with uh, some professor from Princeton University who kind of. So it's not like ChatGPT. It's kind of they use that technology, but uh, to to kind of bring this Princeton mathematician to the students, and then it can talk to them and show empathy and all of that type of thing. Um, this is where the competition is now going to come from. So. And, and there's loads of them out there, Sora schools, Kidato mm -hmm. from uh, out of Africa, a lot of them popped up during COVID and are now going, well, how do we boost what we're doing with artificial intelligence? Um, and we're, we're going to see that. We're gonna, I mean, I, I've got a two and a three-year-old at home. Um, you better believe they're going to be doing synthesis. Like, they, Of course, I can't, I can't as a parent, knowing that that's out there, not put them on that because um, I'd be like, you're missing out there. So I'm, I, I think more parents get awareness of this um, and, and awareness of different provisions and different types of schools. I, I think the, the traditional schooling system is, is going to be faced with real competition. And, and, and going back to kind of uh, equity, um, which was the original question, the, I think what that does to society then is really, really interesting because... What happens when comp when education becomes a private company, like any other company in the world? It's it's subject to the same capitalist um, mm. functionalities. In that, once there's competition, what happens? Things get cheaper and cheaper yeah. and cheaper. And we're going to see affordable private education. But what concerns me is that slice of society that still can't even afford just to pay a little bit extra yeah. for 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 any supplementary or privatized education i think what happens to them and I, i've been to kenya i've spent some time in kenya it's very similar there at the moment they have a very um they have a state system which which works f for the poorest people i mean you see it on tv like literally in in the classrooms are huts uh with old chalkboards mm -hmm. they've got no money um and anyone with any, even just the tiniest bit of money can afford some kind of privatized education um and i i worry that we could be entering and or we might get to a phase like that, um, which is kind of why, why I do what I do, because I'm like, the traditional education system um, needs to wake up. And if it doesn't, we're walking into this type of, um, this type of world where, and, it, and to be honest, I mean, not to get too political, but it's happening to the, the, the NHS in the UK at the moment. It's happening to a lot of public services where, um, those with money are going to be able to get a lot more than those without money. And I think it's yep. happening within education. Um, I think in a, in a certain sense, it's a good thing. It's not all doom and gloom. In fact, I think it's very little doom and gloom because it's, it's an opportunity gonna, for absolutely. development. And as you say, with competition, yeah, things are going to get cheaper. But with that competition, things have to get better as well. And also, so like, it drives the. Yeah, if, I mean, people, like I said, the World Economic Forum, if, the, if, if schools or just going, yeah, 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 okay, you want us to teach collaboration, problem solving, communication, critical thinking, yeah, okay, but we've got, a, we've got this curriculum to get on with, we've got some exams to, to get kids through. Then the <laughs> companies are going to go, well, well we're, not having no, we're not having those graduates. We'll have the graduates from synthesis, please, because they've, they're coming straight out with problem solving skills, the ability to, to solve real world issues, to collaborate. And I think um, education will be subject to the forces within any capitalist um, market in that demand's going to dictate. And 
But yeah. I think that's where we're heading. Well, those studies, studies are out convergent and divergent thinking. It's been around mm. for ages. And I think they went back and this was talking years ago. Top 25 chemistry Nobel Prize winners in America, what universities they went to. And if you ask that question to most people, straight off the bat, they go, oh, it's got to be Harvard or Yale or MIT or those ones. And they said, no, of the 25 chemists, I think it was chemists who won it, they're like, something like 21 different institutions. I said, well, how does that make sense from an educational perspective? Because surely all the brightest and the best will go to those three universities. And, and we see that in schools. And it's like, well, no, because of the skill sets they were taught. It's like you go to, and we see this here, especially in, you know, in Dubai, about academics, this, and it's, it's the grades. A-level results day yesterday. Everyone's going A star to B. In, you know, we get measured in English, science, maths. It's like, well, hang on a minute. Those are just what we would mm. consider purely academic. You take an IQ test, purely academic. Mm. The thing that stands out for me the most was when I was training to teach, I had a, this amazing physics lecturer at, uh, at Loughborough. And he was like, David Beckham is a better physicist than I am. And we're like, what? It's like, he can kick a ball, spin, put it wherever he wants it to go. You know, trajectory, pace, all of those things. You know, I can't do that. He said, and he can do it without thinking. And it was that then interpretation of, oh gosh, yeah, that's really eye-opening about skills and how we view academics versus in a divergent, convergent way. And yet we are sat going, oh, I want my kid to go to this university or this because of the reputation. It's like, well, hang on a minute. It's like, what are the problem-solving skills? What are all these different skill sets they're getting? And, and we're guilty of that, I think, a lot here in terms of those important things they're not getting because I've not got the time. My GCS, I'm too busy. GCSC biology, I'm too busy with that. It's like we've got to get through the content. I don't have enough time. I'll run it as an ECA. Run it after school. Oh, what? So more time in teachers. We said so. So why can't we integrate it? And I think, excuse me, the, the great thing about ChatGPT and, and any AI, and I've got some things to talk about. Is like if I said, oh, I've got to teach this, but can you make it a collaborative lesson? Can you incorporate 15 minutes worth of critical thinking or collaboration um, or any of those things? It's like, yeah, it can do it for you. And all of a sudden, you can bring those other skill sets in and be saying to kids, right, guys, we're going to just spend 10, 15 minutes on this, just so you know, well, what do you think this is? What do you type of, what do you th the skills do you think are involved in that? And it's, it's another way in terms of ideating and coming up with different ways of how you can use it in a resource where you go, I never thought of doing it like that. I would never have thought of that. And it's not just chat GPT now, is it? Like I'm seeing a lot on LinkedIn, teachers talking about Claude 2, in terms of being able to take a PDF or a document and put it onto it and then have that interaction and ask it questions. And even with the chat, is it chat PDF? Yes. I'm looking at that and going, I wonder if I could take you know, a, a PDF document on what is Rosenshine's principles, new teachers, and go, there's the information, ask it. It was in, come up with a prompt, it's really good, and ask it to help. Or, or I've got kids that are struggling. Well, I've managed to convert some text into, into that, put it on there. There's your tutor, guys, go and ask it and integrate. And it's those types of things as well we're seeing now that it's teachers. It's like, oh, we, could, we can show this to kids, but it's, it's what you mentioned, it's the accessibility to it. But these idea of having the bots there almost, I, I'm starting to see that a lot more now where teachers, the technology hasn't really changed. We've just become more innovative with it and going, oh yeah, we could do that with it. And, you know, and that's nine months down the line. Give us another year and the technology improves. And if we continue to innovate and have these collaborative conversations, it's like, can you imagine where education is going to be in a year's time if, if we can get out to the masses and, and encompass it for everyone? It's, uh, it's exciting. I think it's, it's an exciting time. It kind of leads me into my question for you in terms of what do you see in terms of, you know, around the world in the next year, in the next five years, where do you think we're going to be at with this? Uh, I don't know, have you got a crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> got a magic eight ball, just shake it. <laughs> um, I think I kind of liken this to late 90s internet era. So... Um, Back in, let's say, I think it was 1997, so I was, what, about 11 years old. We got our first computer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we I got, was alive. <laughs> <laughs> we got our first computer, I remember. Um, and I think my parents must have like got it on finance because we, were, like, we weren't well off and these things cost, cost a bomb back then. Um, and so we, we set, I remember it was set up back in, in the corner of the dining room, I think it was. Uh, and I remember like going on it once and... It's interesting because I remember, <laughs> I remember like 
I remember going on it and not knowing what I was doing or what I was looking at. Or um, And now that I think back like to my memory of what I was looking at, I think I was just opening a, a folder. Uh, you know when you open a folder? <laughs> and I remember, go, you know, a folder's got like a search bar at the top so you can search for a file. I remember typing in that thinking I was typing into like a search engine and nothing was happening. And I was like, what? That's what's, what's going on here? Um, <laughs> and then I remember my parents after about two months sent it back. I think because they just thought, well, what's, what's, what's the point in this? <laughs> like, it's just obviously just hype. Or why, why do we need a computer? Uh, 1997, so uh, pre-Google, uh, very rudimentary email, very rudimentary um, browser. Um, not much going on out there unless you were into chat rooms and things like that. Uh, very, very basic, isn't it? 1997, fast forward 10 years. 10 years isn't that long. I mean, what was it 2013? If you go back to like two that 2000, 2023, not 2013, but if you go back to 2013, that's like 10 years ago. It feels like yesterday, like 2013. So yeah, yeah. 10 years, not that long from 1997 to 2007. Do you know what happened in 2007? Big tech event. Steve Jobs stood on the stage and introduced the iPhone for the first time. Oh, right. Okay. So literally in those 10 years, like pre Google, uh, very basic functionality. We go from that to the kind of the the introduction to mobile technology, what we've got now, and 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 cloud technology as well. So the advancements happen so so fast. I think we're in that kind of era for for AI at the moment. The, the only difference is AI's or generative AI, to be more specific, is going to it's going to happen a lot faster. It's going to happen a lot, lot faster. Why? Mainly because pe companies have learned the lesson from the internet and, and thought, right, let's run with this right now and go for it. And you, you just have to look at all the advancements and new tools that are coming out on a daily basis. But also, all technology up till this point has always relied on a human advancing it. So human making whatever the the, the technological advancement is and integrating it. The, the thing is with, with AI is that it can learn from itself as well. It learns from the human interaction, but learns things for itself. And that learning can compound. So if it's learning and then take an action on what it's learning, over time, that's going to compound a bit like you put money in on stocks mm -hmm. and shares. You get, I don't know what, 6% return tends to be the average um, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you spread it out. That six percent you put a hundred pound in that becomes a hundred and six pound the next year. So you you invest in hundred and six pound, and and over time, eventually, it's going to get to a point where uh, your your investment is now huge because it's compounded over time. It's going it, the same is going to happen, and and so it leads to predictions like uh, so. Ray Kurzweil, who used to work at Google, uh, top engineer, uh, wrote a book back in two thousand four six called the singularity and he predicted and we're still on track and pretty much everything he said is is come true and on, on his timeline as well which is which is bizarre uh, he said that by 2045 uh, we'll reach a point called the singularity where uh, all artificial intelligence will uh, be far beyond the complete intelligence of the planet in terms of human intelligence uh, and at that point we're not going to understand really what's going on with AI because it's going to be at such an advanced level a human looking is, at it is yeah. not going to fully understand how it's coming to the conclusions that it's coming to we're going to be living in a very different world by that point and he talks about the integration of AI with biology and to to kind of to improve to, uh, human biology as well um I'm looking like a few decades down and it sounds like a sci-fi movie but if you think um I'm I'm thinking like Terminator style, <laughs> you know, integrating with biology, biomechanics. And what was that Johnny everything. Mnemonic? Wasn't there a film? I think it was, was it Keanu Reeves? More like being able to, the, what you can store in your brain, like having those things, like having it hardwired, uploaded into it. That's like the, um, the Black Mirror episode. I think yeah. it's the first Black Mirror episode where he's got the thing in his eye and he goes to like airport security. This is where I think it's going is, is kind of, you know, they had the Google glasses and things mm. like that, but is there going to be some kind of implant that you can get that is allows you to be able to speak different languages or understand like a, like a hearing aid that allows you to be able to communicate with people of different mm. languages and whatever language they're speaking, it can automatically... I mean, that's been around a few years, the Google 
Pixel Buds can do that. Can they? Yeah. No way. They translate. I thought I'd come up with this amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I think I saw it on Future Armor. (laughs) But there's a company called Humane, uh, and they were on a TEDx talk a few months ago. If you go to YouTube, type in TEDx Humane. They... They're prototyping at the minute like a clip-on AI assistant, and they, I think their vision is that it will eventually replace the mobile phone, and it essentially kind of records or, or is aware, I suppose it is record of everything you're doing across your day. So it'll take notes for you, it'll summarize your conversations for you. If you're like, you know, what I had a conversation uh, with Alex at. About two weeks ago, he said something which was quite profound. Um, which uh, I, I, this Alex? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I nearly made the same joke. But I was like, I don't know Alex well enough. I can't. So can't. <laughs> 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 He's just going to look mean. Uh, <laughs> um, so <laughs> sorry, Alex. It's okay. uh, <laughs> Used to it. <laughs> uh, but that will um, that will be able. Yeah, it'll be able to to just to get in recall for you and to, to be honest there are some tools out now that can that can do similar things as if you've got a mac there's i forget what it's called i think it's called something like rewind ai where it literally is recording everything you're doing on your mac all of the time and it stores it locally so that uh, for like privacy issues and if you're if you're if you jump on a video call it'll it'll transcript it all and keep that transcript oh, wow. if you if you go to a website and you just scroll up and down, it'll track everything on that website, everything that's there. So even if you haven't noticed it, but anything that's on your screen, essentially, it'll track it. And then you're able to, via a chatbot, go, you know what, like two weeks ago, I was, I remember opening a website and what, uh, it, or I was on a video call. What was such the percentage of something? I'm thinking like case studies for, for I schooling, thinking, you know? I was thinking Jarvis from Iron Man. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's literally, literally where I got to. Just like Jar, that AI assistant is just. I think we are heading in that yeah. direction. Like, if you look, like we do. I don't know if it's something about just humans. We're influenced by things like Hollywood, and we always go in that direction, mm. don't we? We go in, I suppose, because it's a bunch of humans get down and imagine where this technology could go. You're going to write sci-fi, yeah. Or if you're an engineer, you're going to create that sci-fi as well. So I think we will. We are going in that direction. Um, it's. I was thinking how easy it'd be to blackmail certain people. You know, because if it's recording everything, yeah. some you know, the, it's also as as amazing as that sounds, as incredible as it sounds, it's also a little bit scary. Like you know, you could have done something by accident or gone on somewhere, and then that could become is is that then going to be incriminating evidence later that yeah. you may have been partaking in something illegal, or especially I'm thinking in in certain countries in the world where certain things are not allowed or you know and to be fair you could be you could have a dictaphone on you right now and not be telling anyone that you're recording it but i think um because because you're not a creep you're not doing that hopefully (laughs) (laughs) but but you are you are being recorded (laughs) (laughs) Um, but uh the if that technology is just on us all the time and it becomes more acceptable maybe we it just becomes diluted and we just kind of think, oh, that's what we have to put up with now. But I do think, I mean, there's huge privacy concerns there. Like, are we going to have to get someone's permission every time we have a conversation with them? But it, it, in fact, let me, I was in uh, I was in Tallahassee in Florida a few weeks ago and I was out for dinner with uh, someone I'd just been, it sounds fancy, I've just been recording a TV show with them and uh, Mich- she's, she's called Michelle uh, and if she's watching this, uh, I told her this to her face as well. So uh, <laughs> I don't know where this is going. But, uh, <laughs> but she was wearing this uh, is a family show. <laughs> she, was, she was wearing these glasses, and I think I think you might have mentioned them before, like Google Glass. They, but they yeah. they record. So I think you just press a button, and it records like five seconds or ten seconds of of what's happening. And um, and I knew she was wearing them. She told me about them earlier, and she was like, "Oh, just like if I'm talking to somebody and they've said something, and I'm like, you know, like you know, when you're like, oh, I should should make a note of that. Instead of making a note, she just presses it and records the bit of you talking. So like we were having this conversation and every now and then. She'd be like, and then I was really conscious. I'm, oh my god, I'm just having dinner and now I'm being recorded. Uh, and and I didn't mind it because I knew she was doing it, or or, or I knew she she might do it periodically. Um, so it's completely fine, Michelle, if you're watching. But. Uh, I do think, are we moving more into that world? And if you're not asking, and if people aren't aware that you've got this technology on you, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous world, I think. And we're going to have to, and I think it's probably a conversation for another time, but the whole regulation around that, um, 
we needs to needs to catch up. I think you're right with that. It does. It's it's a nice cliffhanger to to kind of finish that with <laughs> in know, terms of there are ethics, AI ethics, and everything coming into that, and, and frameworks being written for other countries. But you're right with that. It's uh, something to to discuss. I think further I think, down. Yeah, and, I think. Uh, You've hit the nail on the head there with the ethics of it is an entire conversation on yeah. its own, isn't it? As a really, I'm loving it. It's <laughs> oh, yeah, a cool place. <laughs> yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. Really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing that just absolute wealth of knowledge. People want to find out more. People want to get in contact or any of the resources, tools you've got. Um, where can they find it? And what have you got out there for people to use? Yeah, so the, the AI Classroom book uh, is out there. It was released back in March and is helping teachers all over the world. We call it the subtitle is the, the ultimate guide to artificial intelligence and in education. Not because we kind of were saying this is all you'll ever need, but at the moment... It's got, it covers the gambit, really, for schools. So it goes from what is this technology, what does a teacher look like if they're using this technology, what can it bring to them, what are the benefits, how to, how to write questions. It's got the templates, like I've mentioned. It's got what does, what does leadership look like in this new era, where's, where's it all going. So it's, it's about 400 pages long, so it's kind of like, if you're looking for something that covers all of that, uh, uh, check it out. But also my website, theaieducator.io, um, and there's there's resources on there. Um, and that'll get you through to my my Twitter account. It's, I feel weird saying X account. Um, <laughs> that'll get you through to my Twitter account and uh, and LinkedIn. I also do I do a newsletter every week, so where I uh, just write kind of thought pieces, create tutorials. Um, sign up to that on the yeah, so it's, it's literally the the homepage. Go on, and it, the box will be right in front of you. You can sign up to that, and and we've also we created a, a Facebook community, so uh, a Facebook group. I think is that what you call it? Yeah. To be honest, I wasn't really using Facebook until we created this, um, but it's it's great. We've got twenty two thousand teachers are in that group oh, wow. from all over the world, sharing resources. Um, questions, concerns. Um, so it's a great if you want to get to grips with AI in education. Uh, it's a great community to, to to come and join us, and you can just search the AI classroom in Facebook. So yeah, um, lots of ways, and uh, look forward to connecting with people. And you were also saying, obviously, because you were name dropping a few countries. If there's any countries that you you haven't been to yet that you want yeah, to go to, yeah, I'd love a holiday in <laughs> Bali. That would be amazing. So there's any schools in Bali? Uh, I think no, there's some few in Mauritius. I'm sure yeah. I've seen jobs. So you know, there's one in the Maldives. I'll be looking at Bali. You know, we joke, we joke. Yeah, I think my I think Julia, my partner, is going to leave me if I if I go on any more trips without her. So if you can afford to bring Julia along with you as well and the kids, then absolutely go for it. Amazing, amazing. Then, it's, it's well worth it. I'm I would say I've got the news. Newsletter. over six i think it said the last one was like over six thousand teachers on the newsletter yeah, it's, it's yeah. real valuable read wow. yeah like the website and the amount of stuff you also give away for free like is i mean, know we touched on the mid-journey stuff that you've done and and, and other parts yeah. um and some of those courses um, i'm a philanthropist alex just, <laughs> that's what I call. No, uh, no i'm a big believer in obviously it's a business so i've got to got to make a living out of it to, to continue doing it but um i'm a big believer you've got to in order to get people to trust you, you need to show value. And mm. that's part of, that's why I give things away because I'm like, you need to show people that actually what you're doing is valuable. And uh, yeah, I think it is. I think it's, I think it's, it's an education system on a, on a systematic level. We, 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 we got some work to do. Yeah. Well, I think we can all agree it is a value. Yeah. Um, so you haven't used it and the amount of people that do use it in the schools that want you. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. It is of high value, Dan. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And yeah, it's an honor to be on your show. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, oh, oh take that. <laughs> <laughs>